Sarah has been working for the Fox Telescope Project, as have I, as have I even, um, which is based here in South Wales. We've both been working for the project for about 15 years or so. She's currently Director of Education for Fox Telescope Project, and she is the in inclusivity lead for the College of Science in Swansea University, which is about 30 miles down the road. Uh, her talk today is entitled Observing the Universe with the Fox Telescope Project. Over to you, Sarah, if you want to try and share your screen. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me first? I can of hear all? you fine. Yeah, let me see that as well. You can see my screen. Yeah, good to go. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody um, for joining me and thank you for the invite to talk at this uh, conference. I'm really excited to be at GHU, even if we're not physically all meeting together. It's great to be here virtually. Um, so, as Fraser's already said, I'm going to be um, talking about observing the universe with the Fox Telescope Project. Um, so I'm going to go through um, a little bit about robotic or remote control telescopes and you'll have heard some um, talk about this if you watched Andy Newsom's um, speech yesterday. Um, I'll give you a bit of background to the Fox Telescope Project or FTP as we call it for short um, and the telescopes and then I'll go into examples of what students um, can do and what you can do as educators and teachers and how you can actually get involved. So just a brief introduction to robotic telescopes. So a robotic telescope as the, um, as the term sounds like you use telescopes like robots. You don't physically go to the telescope and control the telescope like you would do if you had one in, in your backyard or in your planetarium. Um, you actually obtain the images, you use, the, use and control the telescopes um, from distant sites across the world from the comfort of your own home, essentially. There are three main or two, three two meter um, telescopes that are available for education across the world and I've got them on a map here. So we've got the Fawkes Telescope North in Hawaii over here. We've got Fawkes Telescope South which is in Australia here and I'll talk about them in a minute and then we've got the Liverpool Telescope which is run by the National Schools Observatory which is what um, Andy Newsom was talking about yesterday um, and that's in La Palma. Now, the way that we, these telescopes operate, um, they vary. So the Fawkes telescopes, these two telescopes here, they can operate in live mode or real time mode. So you can physically sit at your computer and control the telescope, watch a webcam moving, and you are in control of that telescope for that um, half hour session that you get. Or there's the offline or queued version of using the telescope, which again, you can use with um, the Fawkes telescopes and also with the with the Liverpool telescope as well. So that's when you submit um, a list of objects that you'd like to observe um, with the telescopes and um, it will do the observations for you. A brief history of the Fawkes telescope project. So the Fawkes telescope project was started by this man here. Um, he gave 10 million pounds of his own money um, in the year 2000 to begin the project to build two two meter telescopes, one in Hawaii, one in Australia. Um, and this was to inspire, engage and enthuse students in subjects such as science, technology um, and IT and maths. So he, this is Dill Fawkes, he made his money um, so he did his, his PhD in the UK, he made his money in computing in America, and when he came back to the UK, he noticed that school students weren't as interested in the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering and maths, and he wanted to do something to help that. So he gave a lot of his own money um, to help begin the project, and um, he then ran the project, or the, the project was run until 2005, when he then sold the project to Las Cumbres Observatory, which at that, that time was run by Wayne Rosen. So it was Wayne Rosen's retirement dream to build a network of robotic telescopes all across the world. So not just one in Hawaii, one in Australia, but a, a whole network across, across the whole world. Um, the Fawkes Telescope Project itself 
now we um, we're separate to LCO. We run the education program mainly in UK and Europe, but we do have global users um, in the Fox Telescope project as well. So we do have people all across the world accessing LCO's telescope through us. But LCO themselves also have um, quite a large education program um, worth having a look at their website as well as the folks one and they have a what's called a global sky partners program so i'll talk a little bit about that towards the end when i explain how you can get involved so this is the network of telescopes that schools and educators can actually use so what we can see here is um, there are three different size telescopes that you can use i'll explain a bit more about them in a minute two meter telescopes, one meter telescopes and 0.4 meter telescopes. So when I talk about the size of the telescope, I'm talking about the size of the mirror. So it's two meters across or one meter across or 0.4 meter across. Um, so we've got a ring of telescopes in the northern hemisphere and we've got a ring of telescopes in the southern hemisphere. And the idea is that wherever you are in the world, there should always be at least a group of telescopes that are in the dark. So you should be always um, able to, to use the telescopes wherever you are. And just to illustrate this, this is a map of, so this is taken from timeanddate.com. This is showing where it's nighttime and daytime at um, 12 o'clock UT in um, today. It's showing where the sun is at this time, um, and we're in Cardiff here. So this is where the sun is relative to Cardiff. Um, and that also shows that the moons are in the sky there. Um, but what you can see here is if you remember, we've got this network of Northern Hemisphere telescopes and Southern Hemisphere telescopes. So if I'm here in Cardiff, then I could use the telescopes in Hawaii or Australia, um, and you can see you can see the line um, here separating day and night. And as this moves across the world, you can see that there'll always be a group of telescopes in the dark. So the telescopes themselves, a little bit of detail. The two Fawkes telescopes, so they're the two meter telescopes that are part of the LCO network. Um, this is the this is a, a picture of them and a design to show you how how they're actually used. So they're called um, it's called the Ritchie Cratian um, design. So the light comes in from the object, hits the primary mirror, the two meter mirror here, which is at the base of the telescope here. It's reflected off the main mirror onto the secondary mirror, which is located just up here and then back down through a hole in the primary mirror, the hole is meant to be there, and onto the CCD camera where it's read out and it's shown as an image and saved as data um, on our computers. So this image, this photo here is just showing you the sheer size of the object. Essentially, when you're controlling one of these five million pound telescopes, you're controlling something that's about the same size as a double decker bus. So those two layer buses that we have in the UK I'm sure you have them across the world as well. That is a, a beast of an instrument to be controlling and you can actually control this in real time over the, uh, over the internet. The telescope itself, so this is FTS, Fawkes Telescope South. That telescope, the one that I've just shown you, the Fawkes Telescope is housed in what's called a clamshell design. So this is the one in Australia and this is the dome for the two meter telescope. So when this dome opens, it opens completely um, so that the telescope is completely exposed to the air, which is great because it means that you can slew the telescope around the sky and you don't have to wait for the dome to sort of follow suit like you do in these, like these larger telescopes here or these smaller telescopes there. Um, and normally you don't get as many sort of convection currents um, affecting the affecting the images either. So to give you an idea of the types of things that you can look at with a two meter telescope, because a two meter telescope is a professional class telescope. Professional astronomers use this telescope as part of their research um, work as well. So the field of view of these telescopes, so that's how much of the sky the telescope can see, is 10 and a half arc minutes. So if any of you aren't familiar with an arc minute, 
if you imagine a circle, a circle has 360 degrees. So if you split that into 360 segments, each of those segments, one degree across, if you split that into 60, again, that would be 60 arc minutes. OK, so each of those even tinier segments is one arc minute. Um, something that we're more familiar with, if we think of the full moon, which is what we've got a picture of here, if we were able to point these two meter telescopes at the full moon, this is how much of the moon we'd be able to see. OK, we're not allowed to point the two meter telescopes um, at, the, at the full moon because the moon is so bright, it would fry the, the um, camera on the telescope. So we can't do that. But this is just to, to give you an idea of what you can actually see in the sky. Um, an even better idea is here are some examples of images that have been taken by various schools um, and astronomy groups who've used the, the telescopes. And these are images of galaxies, of star clusters, of star formation regions, interacting galaxies, um, planetary nebulae. All these images were probably taken in probably, well, less than five minutes anyway, with the, with the telescopes. You can get really, really beautiful images using two meter telescopes because they collect a lot of light. Two meters is a large diameter for a mirror. So it collects a lot of light. So you don't need to use long exposure times. The one meter telescopes, slightly different design. So this is a picture of um, one of the one meter telescopes. Um, in it's actually in the LCO headquarters in the um, back parking lot. Um, but it's a, it's a nice image because it shows the telescope in the dome. And you can see this is more of a traditional telescope dome now. It's not that clamshell design. This has got um, a CCD camera. Again, I'll go through the field of view of the CCD camera. It also does have a spectrograph on it. But at the moment, it's not it's not suitable and it's not used as much for education um, because they don't have a really nice interface to be able to to use it so it's for us we use it for imaging okay so the one meter field of view is 26 arc minutes so again if we were able to point this telescope again we can't at the full moon this is how much we'd be able to see okay so this gives you some sort of idea of um, the sizes of objects that you could look at with these telescopes. And again, here are some examples of some of the, the most beautiful images that have been taken with telescopes. So a couple of spiral galaxies, um, star formation regions, and um, I've got some emission nebula and dark nebula there, and um, globular clusters. So you can, again, get some really, really nice images from the telescopes um, pretty much, much instantaneously. Um, and Fraser's going to give an example of using the telescopes. Um, and I can't remember when, but I've got, I know I've got it in my talk somewhere, so I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight that to you. So you can see how quick and easy it is to use the telescopes. The 0.4 meter telescopes, um, they're placed in clusters um, of between two and four at most of the telescope location sites across the across the globe. Um, it's got different filters in it, so you can take red, green, and blue images, or you can take hydrogen alpha images, or oxygen um, images, or look where the hydrogen and oxygen emission is. This design um, of telescopes, so these are sort of off the shelf telescopes, if you like, and it's in a more of a clamshell design. Um, so they are exposed just like the two meter telescopes are. Um, it's got a 19 by 29 arc minute field of view. So it's a rectangular field of view. So again, comparing it to the full moon, this is the type of size image that we would get. And this is uh, one of the images that I found um, that was taken by an amateur astronomer who works with us. He does a, um, a lot of imaging for us, Pete Williamson. Um, this is an image that he took of the um, of a of a star cluster or star formation region. Sorry. So using the telescopes, there are two ways in which you can use the telescopes. So there's what's called the Q request. So this is, as you can see from um, the screenshot here, it's a little bit more involved um, and probably better to do once you've got um, used to planning your obsession, your, your um, observing session on the telescopes and getting data back. 
Um, what you do is you put in some information about what, obs what observation you'd like, what image you'd like, what telescope you want to use, what filter you'd like to use, the exposure time, um, a bit more information if you want to make it a bit more complicated, like looking at a moving object. Um, and then you click submit and it uploads it and then the telescope scheduler will then decide when is the best um, window for visibility or the best window for observing. It takes that image and then you can get an email to tell you once that observation has been made. The RTI um, interface, the real-time um, interface, so this is something that we suggest that beginners of the telescopes um, use. So it's a lot simpler to use. And I personally prefer the, the real-time interface, but that's because I like, there's a, there's a telescope webcam that shows you the telescope moving. And if you're using this in front of a class, um, you put your target name in and it does give you suggestions for target names and suggestions for what filter and exposure time to use. You click go and you can watch the webcam on the webcam. You can watch it move to the telescope slew to the target and then you wait for it to, to take the image. And that's one of the wow factors when when people are using the telescopes is actually knowing that you're in control of the telescope for half an hour at a time. And you're actually making the images um, that are coming out there. So I mentioned that Fraser, who's the chair of this session, is um, doing a real time observing se um, session. So that's on August 25th at 1545. So definitely worth having um, watching that. And fingers crossed the weather will be OK for it. So let's go into what the students can do with the telescopes, because this is the most exciting part. Because there are the three different sizes of telescopes, you can observe virtually anything that you want to in the, in the night sky. So deep sky objects such as galaxies or nebulae, star clusters, they're perfect um, for using um, the large telescope, the two meter telescopes. Um, if, you're using, if you've only got limited time maybe in your account because they collect so much light, so we have shorter exposure times. They're fainter objects typically, so you can really collect a lot of light from them. Um, we've had students looking at planetary nebulae and supernovae, and I'll go into that in more detail um, in a minute. Asteroids and comets are a very popular target for schools using our telescope. It's a little bit more advanced than just choosing an object and then taking an image because asteroids and comets move in the sky relative to the stars in the background. So you do have to find out where the objects will be at the time of your session. Um, so there is, there's a little bit more work involved in that, but it's great. And we've had students doing that, school pupils doing that themselves. Um, we've had teachers doing it themselves, but quite often the teachers will set it for homework for the school students, for example, so that they can actually do the work. And we have had students who are um, who work with um, professional astronomers as well. Sometimes they do work experience, so they might go to a planetarium um, or a university department where they work with astronomers and they use the telescope to observe, for example, exoplanet transits. So this is when you have a, uh, a star and you have a planet that orbits it and you can actually look at the star and you can measure the light coming from the star and you can see the dip, if you plot the light, you can see the dip as the planet transits in front of the star. So we've had students doing this as well and I'll show you a graph of that in a minute. We've had lots of um, users who don't just use the um, telescopes to do science, but they do cross-curricular projects. So they do maths with the telescopes. You can do, you can teach angles with the telescopes, looking at galaxies at different angles. Um, you can do um, art with the telescopes. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but this is this is one project um, on this page that I particularly liked um, because it was a school's French class that used the telescopes. Um, so not typically what we do in our language classes in the UK, you don't normally control a robotic telescope, um, but they were looking at Messier objects. So Charles Messier was the, um, he compiled the Messier catalogue of um, deep sky objects. 
he was a, a comet hunter, um, but when he noticed these fuzzy blobs in the sky, he made a catalog of them because he wanted to just sort of highlight them to other comet hunters that they're not comets, these fuzzy objects, but they were galaxies or star clusters. So um, deep sky objects in their own right. Um, so this French class, um, because Charles Messier was French, they did a whole poster and they did a calendar um, all about Charles Messier and all about the objects that they looked at. Um, and it was all in French as well. So it was a really nice, nice project for them to do and something completely different to what had been done with the telescopes before. Um, this is um, some particularly artistic images that were taken with the telescopes. Um, so you've got the base image of the, the telescopes themselves, obviously this smiley face, there's no smiley face um, constellation or galaxy cluster or star cluster that I know of um, in the universe. But these, um, so we ran a, a, an astro imaging workshop with some, um, I think they were 11 year old students. So they used the telescopes, they got the data, and then they used, um, in this case, it was the GIMP um, image processing package. But you can use Salsa J, which is very good um, for making the red, green, and blue images, or you can use Photoshop if you have access to that. They used the GIMP and then they added all these extra special effects to this. Um, but it, again, it was really nice because you could talk about the science um, behind the um, images, but you could also look at the, the arts part of it as well. You can take pretty pictures with a telescope. I've shown quite a few pretty pictures, but you can get science from the pictures as well, okay? So this is an image of M87. So this is a giant elliptical galaxy in the um, Virgo cluster of galaxies. And this galaxy here, you can just about see, has a jet coming from the supermassive black hole at the center. And so we've got an activity on our website where you can take an image of the of M87 using the telescope and then using Salsa J, you can actually measure how long this jet is. And if you know what the pixel size um, is of the, the telescope or the CCD um, frame, then you can actually calculate the physical size of the jet there. So again, a nice use of maths in there and some science. This is a, an image that was taken um, by a school technician, actually, um, in the UK, and is a beautiful picture of M51. So this is the Whirlpool galaxy, cannibalizing a smaller dwarf galaxy here, um, so with the effects of um, gravity. What you can see highlighted here is not a star, but a supernova. So they caught a supernova going off in this galaxy as well. And then what you can do is keep looking at this object over time and you can plot a light curve of how the supernova light decreases over time. And you can see what type of supernova explosion it was as well. So science, but beautiful pictures as well. Um, a typical project um, that a lot of schools, at least in the UK would do because it's part of the, the curriculum is looking at the life cycle of stars. So the basic project for this would be observing stars um, or observing objects that show stars at different life stages. So for example, here we've got the Eagle Nebula, we've got the birth of stars, um, we've got the life of stars, so stars living in a globular cluster, older stars here, and the death of stars. So this is a picture of a supernova remnant. And schools have created posters. We've got a poster template where you can put the images on there and there's information about the different stages. And again, it's a bit of an arts um, project, but it's also a science uh, project as well. And if you then wanted to go a bit deeper um, and go to a higher level, you can talk about, and you can plot your own hirschsprung russell diagrams. So this is the plot of a life cycle of a star. Um, so on the left here, we've got um, a younger cluster. So this is M67, an open cluster, and we've got an older globular cluster. So um, thousands of stars held together um, in quite concentrated way by gravity. So this is M4. And the, the sort of ob observational astronomers um, equivalent of a HR diagram, it's not luminosity and temperature that we're plotting, but it's the um, 
So if, if you're using a blue and a green filter or a B and a V filter, you've got color on the X axis here and you've got the magnitude, the V magnitude here on the Y axis. So what you can do is have a look at the main sequence you can see where the main sequence turnoff is. So this the main sequence is where your, your star is in the stable, the adult part of its life cycle. And then as it evolves, it turns off and it goes into the red giant branch. A shorter main sequence um, for a star cluster shows that it's an older cluster. So that's what we're seeing here. So this is um, the sort of main sequence. This is the, the Hirschman russell diagram for an open cluster, NGC 957. We've got all the data ready for people to use. Um, this is just an example of another um, HR diagram for a different star cluster. And this is one that we had a, um, he was, I think a 16 or 17 year old student who came in and worked with us. Um, and he looked at this cluster, he plotted the color magnitude diagram, but he also highlighted some stars in here, which, showed variability. So he did sort of point the telescope um, at this star cluster for a number of days, if not weeks, and he looked at how the stars light varied over time. And I think he actually discovered some new variable stars in the cluster. So you can make new discoveries with the telescopes. And this is a prime example of making new discoveries. So apologies if you've seen this before in any of our talks, but I, I love showing this because it gives you something to, to focus on. So this is hunting for asteroids. Can you spot the asteroid in this telescope image? Probably the answer now, obviously I can't hear you, but you're probably thinking, well, of course not. How do we know? So somewhere in, somewhere in this image um, is an asteroid and the other white blobs are stars. It's generally easier if we invert the colors. So if we turn the stars black and turn the black background um, pale. Now, what you have to do if you're trying to find asteroids is you can't just tell with one image which one's the asteroid because you can't see it moving. But if you take a series of images, so I've got three images here, if you watch the image closely, the stars should stay in the same place and the asteroid, if it's in there, should show up. Right. Can you see where the asteroid is here? If you can't, I'm going to show it you now. So this is the asteroid, asteroid in this image. OK, so it's quite an obvious one. It's obvious when you've been shown it. But did anybody spot this asteroid? Very, very faint, but still in the same image. When this image was taken, um, the, the observer was looking at this or looking for this asteroid here. And this was just an accidental discovery, okay? Um, or an accidental um, observation. I'm not sure whether it was the new discovery, but it just goes to show that you can take these images and you never know what you're gonna get in them, especially if it's um, sort of real time mode. You have to look at the images straight away if you wanna see if you've got a new discovery in there. Um, this is another, another thing that um, a group of schools from across Europe did. This was quite a few years ago now, this was eight years ago. Um, but again, it's something I still put in my talks because I think it's a great example of participation and collaboration. This was a full day's worth of observing and we were looking at this asteroid here, asteroid um, Kariba. That asteroid there, again, just happened to be in the same field of view when the images were taken. And this, so this was six schools from the UK, Ireland, Poland, Portugal, and France. And they sat on this asteroid essentially with a telescope all day. Um, I helped coordinate it. So I was talking to some of the students at the time. And what they plotted then um, was a plot of time and the magnitude and how the magnitude changed for that asteroid over time. So this is the different data points from each of the schools there. And so you can see that the asteroid isn't just moving across and staying the same brightness as it, as it moves across the frame, but it's actually tumbling. Um, I don't know if I've got something that I can hmm, show you. If I show you my phone here, an asteroid like this would be tumbling. So you can see different parts of the asteroid reflecting different amounts of light as it tumbles through space. And so you can measure the rotation rate of the asteroid. 
And I men mentioned earlier that we've had students doing um, exoplanet transits as well. That's something you can do with the, with the telescopes. Um, so this, again, was a collaboration. So this was um, five schools, all based um, in UK and Ireland. And they looked at a known um, exoplanet target, so Corot 2b. Um, and they actually did plotted the light curve. So it's all the same technique again, um, just measuring the amount of light that a star gives out and seeing what happens to that light. So here we've got the light coming from the star and then there's a dip in the light, a bit of a blip there. And then it goes up again, I'm not sure what the blip is. Um, but this, block, this is where the planets, the extrasolar planets start to block the light out from the star. So those were types of things that um, schools and teachers and educators have done with the telescopes, um, just either using guidance from the Fawkes Telescope website um, or just topics and subjects that they've actually picked themselves. But what we also try and do is encourage um, professional and amateur astronomers to work using our telescopes, but using um, but working with schools as well. So because we've got professional class telescopes at our fingertips, um, researchers do want to use the telescopes. And so we say to them, OK, you're welcome to, but let's get the schools involved and get them doing real science um, and real research. So some examples of that. We've been working with the European Space Agency Gaia mission, um, basically since it launched in what's it, 2013. Um, we've been working with Cambridge University and the Gaia people there, and they set up a Gaia alert system. Um, so the ESA Gaia mission is a, is a mission to map a billion stars in our galaxy. So the mission itself mainly um, is to map the positions um, of the stars in our galaxy, or at least a billion stars in our galaxy, um, and to make this beautiful stellar map. But there are other um, science programs going on with that. So they, they're going to catch a lot of asteroids in there. And the things that we were most interested in was the supernova explosion. So supernova is when a, a star at least 10 times the mass of our sun gets to the end of its life cycle and it can't um, do any more nuclear fusion. And you basically get a, it collapses in, it rebounds, you get a shock wave, you get an explosion. And that's what you see as a supernova. Um, in some of the images that I've shown you. What you can do is do follow-up work with the Fawkes telescopes and the two meter telescopes are brilliant for this because you can really go to where the, the supernova looks really faint, fainter than with amateur um, astronomy telescopes maybe. And you can pr produce a light curve of how the light changes over time. This is with different filters and this is time here. So this is, this is one of the alerts. So Cambridge University and the ESA mission, they have a list of targets that they need follow-up work done on. They put that on their um, Gaia Alerts website, and then we either link to it from our folks' website, um, or we can point you to the, to the Gaia Alerts site, and then you can pick the target that you want. You're, you're shown where that target would be in an image and then you take the image and you can do the photometry yourselves and then you can upload the data to the Gaia site so you are genuinely helping scientists with their research and we had a school in London Eastbury Community School who were the sort of pilot school for doing this um, supernova research in collaboration with the in Institute for Research in Schools um, and the group of students they had um, they actually got to go to the Royal Astronomical Society in London and they gave a presentation to the Gaia scientists um, all about how they had plotted their light curve of a specific um, supernovae. So they did have help from us and they had help from um, the um, Gaia astronomers as well in Cambridge, um, but they, they managed to actually um, contribute to real science, which, which was great. I would also recommend, so on Wednesday the 26th in session seven, um, a teacher from the UK, Kevin Mosdale, he's going to be talking about supernova hunting with robotic telescopes. So if this is something that you're interested in, definitely worth um, popping into his um, talk. I wanted to show this um, because also We've got another session or session 11, Alvaro Folhas from um, Portugal. He's going to be giving um, another sort of 
robotic telescope related talk about interdisciplinarity in an astronomical observation by remote access in real time. And I wanted to show um, one of his images or his, cl his astronomy club's images um, because he has, him and his students have been really, really good users of the Fawkes telescopes. Um, and they were looking at, so this is a picture taken with a one meter telescope of a supernova um, that went off in Centaurus A. So this is a, a sort of before image and then an after image of the, um, of the supernova here. So you can see that schools, not just in the UK, but from across Europe, across the world, have been using the, the telescopes to, to do similar things as well. The, the other thing that uh, the telescopes are good for is looking at asteroids, comets, and NEOs, near Earth objects. So with the telescopes, we have a lot of observing programs where we look at asteroids and comets in space, but we also link that to a project that we also run called the Down to Earth Project, which is all about impacts, what happens when things hit the Earth from space and meteorites. So again, another plug for a session. Session 13, Paul Roche, who's the director of the Fawkes Telescope Project, is going to be talking about the Down to Earth Project. So if you want to find out more about that and how you can use that um, in your classroom, then Friday morning is the, is the session to be at. We've had um, some discoveries um, by students using the telescopes. So in 2018, um, there was this German school student who was working with an astronomer in Germany. So this is leaving Belly. He discovered an asteroid. So you can see the asteroid in this GIF here, and it's highlighted here. So he used the telescope. He discovered his own asteroid um, and confirmed the asteroid. And he also, he wrote this up as a project and when, when the first place um, in the regional competition, the school's experiments um, competition that they ran um, in Germany. So that was that was absolutely brilliant for him, brilliant for the for the project as well. Um, something more recent. So there was a comet that was discovered um, towards the end of March this year. It was discovered by the Neowise Space Telescope. So this is a um, um, a NASA telescope, it's an infrared um, wide field survey telescope that's been sort of re recommissioned, if you like, to look for near Earth objects in the sky. And they discovered a new, a new comet um, March the 27th, I think it was. It was reported on March the 31st that the telescope had found this object. And so this was the space, so they took space images of it. And then a few hours later, a group of students and teachers in Germany used Fawkes Telescope South to take the very first images of this new comet from Earth. So they were the first people on Earth to actually observe, or the first people to observe the, the comet on Earth, which again was brilliant for the, for the teachers. So this is the, um, is the AIM project, which stands for Astronomy and Internet in Munster. So this is um, run by the Pascal Gymnasium in, in Munster. Um, so this is, I think, a, a sort of collaboration with a local planetarium and schools and using robotic telescopes, um, not just the LCO ones, but other robotic telescopes to actually do real research with the, with the students. And we are working, so one of our team members, Helen Usher, she's a PhD student with the, um, with the OU and working um, also with the University of Edinburgh and Cardiff University. She is um, doing her PhD on comet, for, well, on comets generally, I think, but particularly on comet 46P. Um, and she led a, um, an observing campaign um, last year to actually take images of 46p um, when it was visible in the sky. So here we've got some images of <laughs> um, some school students in the UK who actually use the telescopes and also we have primary school students. These are students who are um, between 7 and 11 years old. Um, they also use the telescopes to, to actually look at the comet and all the images that they that they took are able to go into Helen Usher's PhD because she's actually studying the comet and she can do measurements of the comet as well. So it is actually genuinely helping research there. 
very wordy slide. There are quite a few talks going on in this conference, I'm pleased to see, um, that are related to either the Fawkes Telescope project um, or things that schools and educators have done using the, using the telescopes. There's only so much that I can talk about in, in my slot. So August the, the 25th, um, that's tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, 11.55, Philippe Cobel is talking in French um, about, um, I don't know because I don't speak French, but he's talking about supernovae and the universe. And so that's probably worth, a, definitely worth a, a watch. And then Fraser Lewis, again, who um, was chairing this session, he's talking on the 27th um, of August, session 11. Um, he's going to be talking about examples of student-led research using robotic telescopes. And he's also running a workshop then the next day um, with a student-led hands-on activities using real astronomical data. So again, if you're interested in getting involved with the folks project and maybe using the data or seeing what you can do, definitely worth going to those talks and workshops. So you might be thinking, okay, well, how can I get involved in using the telescopes? Um, the first step I would say is to check out Las Cumbres Observatory's Global Sky Partners page. So they launched their programme in 2017. Um, again, they wanted to inspire teachers and students to do real research um, and engage in astronomy. So they provide over a thousand hours of telescope time for various projects around the world. Um, and on their Global Sky Partners pages, um, there's a list of all the projects. So there may be um, a project that's running in your country that you can actually get involved with. Um, if there isn't, then don't worry, you can contact us, the Contact the Folks Telescope project team, and we can give you an account on the telescope or give you um, time on the real time slot um, and give you any information that you want for any educational projects as well. So to summarise, um, you can have online access to Research Class Telescope um, network and to the data as well. So all the data that's taken with the telescopes for education is freely available for anybody to access and anybody to use straight away. So you don't even have to use the telescopes if you don't want to, you can just um, download the data and do analysis on that. And we do encourage schools um, to work with professional and amateur astronomers on research projects. And we have had, I'm sure Fraser will talk about this in, in his talk, we have had a number of schools um, who've been on research papers as well um, because their images have made it or their data has made it into research um, groups. I'll just before I stop, um, plug some other talks of interest. Um, so these are talks um, given not necessarily Forks related, but they're from members of the, the Forks team or things that we're related to. So Sophie Bartlett um, is going to be given um, a talk on August 26th about evaluation and evaluating the impact of space science and young people's attitudes and aspirations. And then on the 27th of August, um, Rosie Kane and Tony Thompson are going to be talking about educational resources for Europlanet 24. Um, the Forks Telescope project has recently become a lot more involved in the Europlanet project, um, so it's worth, it's worth going to those two talks. I will finish there. Thank you very much for listening. Here's some ways that you can contact us or get involved with the Forks project, but I will finish there and see if there are any questions. Sarah, thanks very much. That's a real whistle-stop tour around robotic telescopes. Adds really nicely to the, the stuff that Andy Newsom was showing us yesterday about the, their work up in Liverpool as well. Yeah, we've got two questions. I think I've got a couple of little questions for you as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold those back for now. Um, so I think these two are probably related. So I'll throw these two at you and see where we go. So Soham is asking if the telescopes are available for schools and amateurs all over the world, which I think you've already touched on a little bit and Johannes and I've been a bit sneaky and had a look on Google and I found out where Johannes lives not not your own name not your own name just just the country um, and he's saying he's not a teacher but he'd like to use the telescope he's an adult educator working at his local observatory and it would be fantastic to offer some sessions to the public and Johannes is as they is in Austria so he's probably not that far from some colleagues of ours already ah okay yes 
Yeah, so basically, um, obviously, if we gave everyone in the world time on the telescopes, we wouldn't have enough sessions for everyone. Um, so what we try and do is encourage schools and educators to use the telescopes first. So amateur astronomers can use the telescopes if they're using it for educational purposes and if they're if they're linking it with schools or, or young people. Um, I would advise having a look first on the LCO Global Sky Partners page if um, to see if there's a project running in your country. Um, because as I say, the Folks project is mainly UK and Europe, um, but we do have we do have people from across the world um, using time on the telescopes. If there isn't any project running in your country on the LCO pages, then you are more than welcome to email me. Um, let me know what you want to do with the telescopes, and we can we can probably set you up with an account. Um, what was the the second one? Um, Austria was that the same same question basically oh adult educator working in a local observatory yeah definitely again if you're um if you're doing things for the general public um and if there are schools or young people involved in that then we're happy to give sessions on the telescope and give advice on what you can look at and um, that's fine because we we've um there are some sort of um science festivals that we've done definitely warsaw science festival um there's another one happening or has happened fairly recently um, where they've got sessions on the telescopes. They don't necessarily have an account, but they've had real time sessions um, that they've requested from us. So that that's absolutely fine. As long as it's for education, um, it's for the good of the children, as it were, then, yeah, we're happy to give accounts, basically. If you're talking, Fraser, you're on mute. <laughs> I'll work this Zoom thing out one of these days. I was just going to say, it was a private conversation. Um, I was just going to say to Johannes, it might be worth his, him contacting us directly and we can put him in touch yeah. with our, our colleagues in Austria who are yeah. doing similar things already. Um, another question has flashed up, which is from Azim, and he's asking if you can show how they can access the resources on the dimension during the talk. So I don't know if you want to I can. share the... Oh. resources page or is that a bit yeah so i'll stop sharing my page at the moment and get it get it up and ready um right so just 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 to, just to fill in a minute while you're doing that then um my real-time session sarah i gave you the wrong time i gave you the time that that session will will happen on my clock but my real-time session is actually booked for tuesday at 2 45 ut 14 45 ut oh. it's something something that we all have to think about the times one of our sessions right so some of the resources that i mentioned can you see this screen yeah, okay, fine. So the main Forks website, I'm glad someone asked this question because that's that was bad that I didn't even mention it. The main website is forks-telescope.com. So this is where we have information about the Forks project itself, how you can um, register, um, exciting targets, image gallery and um, news articles. But there's a link here, there's a lot more information here there's a link here to educational resources and this takes you to our resources page so this is um, a moodle virtual learning environment um, and this is resources.forks-telescope.com so this is where you will find all our resources that we've written um, some of it does need updating um, because most of us in the Forks project do it um, in addition to our full-time jobs, it's sort of a labour of love. Um, so we're volunteers doing it. So some of it does need some updating, but there's lots of information, including um, data sets as well. So you don't even need to use the telescope. Or if you use the telescope and it's weathered out um, and you wanted to do that class on supernovae, you can download data from here as well. Okay. Just to add to that, Sarah, if, if you weren't already about to say it, all, all of this material is free of charge. Um, 
very little of it is behind a password so it's available to, to most all of you know to pretty much all of you to, to access as, as and well you choose yeah yeah i should say that and anything that we do whether it's um well, answering emails whether it's providing resources teacher training anything like that it's all free of charge um and if you did want to um sort of have maybe a, a Skype conversation with us to talk about it or to talk to your, your kids in the classroom, then we're happy to do that. You just have to contact us and um, just find a time for us to do that. I'll just give us more work, Fraser. That's fine, isn't it? Yeah, why not? None of us are busy right now. We'll um, volunteer Paul and everyone else who's not on this. Absolutely. We'll give you everyone else's email address within the project and not our own. Um, the one that you mentioned with Philippe for tomorrow is, uh, as, as your French probably got you halfway towards, um, Philippe will be discussing a project that he and I set up, which was looking at um, images of supernovae and using those supernovae to measure the age of the universe. Doesn't sound like a very ambitious project at all. Ties in with the work that Carl was talking about yesterday in, in the introductory session, that we can understand something about the way the Big Bang happened and the expansion and the age of the universe just by imaging stars in nearby galaxies. Another question just came in, Sarah, if you're okay, if you're still there for one yeah. more, yeah. Uh, which is from Christos and he's saying, is the Fox telescope available for primary school pupils? It is, uh, we, we don't have any any rules on who who uses the telescope, uh, what age schools use the telescope. So we have had primary school pupils using the telescopes. And if you're doing sort of simple imaging, then yeah, it's it's easy enough for them to use the telescope. Some of our act, most of our resources um, are aimed at more high school student age, so eleven plus. Um, but there are some sort of resources on there that would be suitable for primary school. But yes, by all means, primary schools can use the telescope as well. We have undergrads using the telescope as well, so it goes from, and I think in um, we had a Welsh festival where I was in a science tent and I had a three-year-old who used the telescope once. So from three to, I don't know what the oldest person is who used the telescope. Um, they didn't really know what they were doing. They were just pressing buttons, but yeah, they enjoyed themselves. This just sounds like me. <laughs> Same message. Sarah, that's fantastic. I think we're all done on questions for now. So we will give you a round of applause for those of us that have video.